problems while going through problems. All right, so that's the other piece. These slides, probably I have maybe a dozen slides. They certainly do not cover the material to the depth that you would need to understand what's happening. Okay, so chapter 14, here we go. The topics that are covered. This is as for your state course, course outline. Um, so the state course outline, that's interesting. They put the accounting for asset retirement obligations under long-term liabilities. Your textbook uh, covered it in chapter 13. So we've already covered asset retirement obligations there. We will be talking about long-term notes payable as well as bonds payable. And uh, we will be talking about the differences um, between IFRS and ASPE as they come up. So long-term liabilities by definition are liabilities that are not current liabilities. Current liabilities are those that we know will be paid within 12 months from the date of the balance sheet or within the next operating cycle, whichever is longer. So any obligations that will be paid after 12 months or like a period at more than 12 months from the date of the balance sheet or um, the normal operating cycle, whichever is longer of the two are called long-term liabilities. And the usual suspects there include long-term notes payable, mortgages, bonds, and then there are some specific examples that we will be looking at in later chapters, and those would be pensions that's covered in chapter 19 and lease liabilities that's covered in chapter 20. So we're not gonna be talking about pensions and leases in tonight's discussion. So accounting issues when we are dealing with long-term debt. Long-term debt is just another term used for long-term liabilities. Um, so when we initially recognize the liability, it's got to be recorded at its fair value. For liabilities, the fair value is, is essentially present value, right? Using a financial calculator, we figure out the PV of future cash flows that have to be incurred, that have to, have to be made uh, for the particular liability. Now, if in, in certain cases, there might be, uh, the liability may not have been issued for cash. It might have been incurred for some non-cash consideration. In that case, the rules about exchanges kick in and we record the liability at the present value of the non-cash consideration that the business received in exchange. And that will usually be the case for long-term notes, right? So in the examples for long-term notes, we'll see that happening. The um, uh, fair value that we calculate, the PV, may not be equal to the face amount. Uh, and that, that is specific to notes payable, the bonds payable. Uh, those liabilities are written promises. So they, they, they contain uh, an amount that the company must pay to the creditor upon the liability's maturity, right? So if you think about a note payable, the note payable will state uh, the, the, the note holder will be paid a sum of so many dollars. Now that amount that's stated uh, is the face value. Now the present value of that calculation, when we, when we use discounting, the present value that we end up calculating may not be the same as the face amount. And so it is important to keep that in mind. Long-term liabilities may initially end up getting recorded either at a premium to the face amount or a discount to the face amount. Now, premiums, discounts, it's likely you heard about these terms in your earlier classes. It's when the, the amount that we are recording the item at is either more than the face amount or lower than the face amount. If it's lower, then it's at a discount. If it's higher than the face amount, then it's recorded at a premium. And when you have these premia or discount involved, the premium or the discount needs to be amortized up to over rather the time to maturity, right? So there is an amortization involved, involved 
And that under IFRS is done using what's called the effective interest rate method. Now, sometimes if a company is borrowing money, especially in the form of issuing of bonds, uh, what companies will do is they will make use of an investment banker, right? And the investment bankers charge the company that's issuing the bonds some commission, right? So there is a there is a financing cost, a cost of issuing the bonds. Now, whatever cost of issuing the debt is incurred needs to be subtracted from the fair value that we calculate. So the initial amount that we record would be the present value of the cash flows, and you want to minus from that dollar value any issuance costs, all right? When we look at examples, it'll make more sense. But just keep in mind, if you see issuance costs, the issuance costs are subtracted from the present value calculated for the debt. And so that automatically, when you subtract the issuance costs, that's automatically going to result in a discrepancy. Even if we had issued the debt at par, right, at face value, if there was an issuance cost, subtracting the issuance cost will mean that the uh, long-term debt gets initially recorded at a discount, and therefore there's gonna be an amortization needed, all right? So subsequent measurement for the most part happens at amortized cost. And in intermediate one, you folks would have learned about investments that are recorded at amortized cost. In chapter nine, you may have learned about investments in bonds that were reported at amortized cost. So here in this chapter, we'd be looking exactly at the mirror image of that from the point of view of the company that issued the bond. For a company that invested money in buying the bonds, it was an investment. For the company that issued the bonds, those bonds represent a liability, right? So this is just the opposite side of the proverbial coin. Now, the amortization of any premium or discount is done using the effective interest rate, and that's at IFRS for you. ASP allows companies to, if they want to, they can use the effective interest rate method, or ASP also allows companies to amortize any premium or discount using the straight line method. Just kind of simplifies uh, life a little bit for the accountants. And uh, hopefully we'll take a look, quick look. That IFRS allows a fair value option for companies. And if they use the fair value option, then what happens is that we don't have to worry about preparing a bond amortization schedule or any of that stuff. We can record interest expense regularly based on the amount of periodic payment and any fair value changes that occur. Now the fair value of a bond or a long-term debt essentially is always calculated using the present value. So present value calculated on the balance sheet date using the discount rate that exists on the balance sheet date. Discount rates change in line with uh, market interest rates. So as the Bank of Canada raises interest rates, right? Recently they raised the, uh, the, the benchmark interest rate by half a percent. In June, it's expected the rate will go up another half a percent. In July, another half a percent. Now, obviously, as the Bank of Canada raises interest rates, the bond markets follow suit, right? So the market rates also kind of keep go up. They may go up by half a percent, exactly the same magnitude as the Bank of Canada raises. Sometimes the rate might go up a little bit more. That just would be reflective of markets anticipation of what the risk would be, sometimes it might be less, right? So the bond yields may not always move in lockstep with uh, central bank rates, but economic theory predicts that if a central banker raises interest rates, the bond rates will go up, right? And what happens when these rates go up is that the rates are used as a discount rate to calculate the present value, so if your discount rate goes up, the bond valuations will go down. So anybody that's invested in bonds 
they're going to be really, really worried about what's going to happen because the bond markets, you know, the stock markets, uh, they're worth billions of dollars. Bond markets operate in the magnitude of trillions of dollars. They're like huge as compared to the stock market. And uh, yes, when interest rates go up, the bond prices go down and that can cause a lot of anxiety, right? So um, companies that issue debt have an option to report that debt at, uh, at fair value. And if they choose to do so, then any changes in the fair value of their debt under IFRS 9 gets reported either in PL, in profit and loss, or if they make the choice to use other comprehensive income, they can go with OCI. Derecognition is the third accounting issue. Um, so mostly what happens is the debt matures, the company pays it back, right? So you have that happen, it's pretty straightforward. There will be no gain or loss recorded. Date of maturity, the carrying amount of the debt will be equal to its face value because any uh, premium or discount will have been amortized by that time. So that's the cleanest of all. And in reality, for the most part, that is what you will find happening in, I would say, 90% of the cases. Sometimes companies can choose to, um, to repay their debt early, right? If the company is repaying their debt earlier than the maturity date, then uh, there can be a difference between the carrying amount of the debt and the amount that the company pays. And if there is a difference, there could be a resulting gain or loss that arises. So that gain or loss gets recorded in profit and loss, right? If you have a gain recorded as a gain that causes net income to go up, a loss will reduce net income. Now, what could be those circumstances? Uh, most common would be early redemption. So if the company's issued redeemable bonds and chooses to redeem them early, well, that's, uh, that's the situation. Uh, another word used for redemption is settlement, right? So sometimes the liability could just get settled. Um, now, what would that mean? Usually it is by paying cash, but sometimes a company might just transfer something else, right? Some other asset to settle the debt. Sometimes it could be refinancing. Companies, um, you know, often, uh, you know, when their bonds come or come close to maturity or if they have some other long-term debt that, get, that gets close, close to maturity, they might just replace it with another debt, right? So they might just refinance that debt. So company has bonds payable, they're coming up for maturity in 2022, the company can issue new debt and then just pay off the earlier earlier bonds, right? So that's just a rollover of debt. Um, the, some companies can sometimes set up a trust account and transfer assets to a trustee um, saying, okay, right now my liability is worth X amount of dollars. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm giving you, Mr. Trustee, the amount of money. From this point onwards, you take care of paying off the debt. And that is called a defeasance. Uh, and uh, sometimes companies are able to do that. And why would a company want to do it? They, maybe it just wants to make its balance sheet look a little bit healthy. Maybe it's a private company that's looking to go public and doesn't want to create an impression that it's already loaded up on debt. So maybe just wants to do some spring cleaning on that count. Um, if, if a company does defease the debt, it basically counts as early retirement and there could be a gain or loss. Um, restructuring is basically a euphemism for um, a company saying uh, we messed up, right? We took on too much debt. Now we are not able to repay based on the original terms. So either we file for bankruptcy and we have to liquidate or Mr. Creditor work with me. And uh, you know, you, you've probably heard the saying, <clears throat> if you owe the bank a thousand dollars, it's your problem. You owe the bank $10 million, it's the bank's problem. Right, so when with companies, they typically have a lot, you know, big amounts of debt, 
And uh, usually the creditors have to bite the bullet. They have to work with the company because otherwise it just means writing off huge amounts as uncollected. So restructuring is not, you can end up with a gain on restructuring, you know, as a, as a debtor, as a company that, that's, that's issued the debt, the company can end up recording a gain on restructuring. But if you were like an employee for the company or a, an investor into the company, that's like huge warning signals. And I can speak from personal experience. Very recently, I came across a stock that had fallen quite a bit. And uh, I figured, you know what? It's an energy company. It's called Western Energy Services, something like that. Western Energy Resource. Don't even remember the name of the company, to be honest. And the stock price had fallen quite a bit. It, it, it's a small penny stock type company. So I thought, you know, probably not a bad idea. And I went and bought a you know, small position a couple thousand shares at 15 cents per share. I did not find out why the company stock had fallen. So it turns out that the company had, basically the company owed $100 million to Alberta Investment Management Company, AMCO. And the company basically was not doing well. It's in the business of drilling and so on, right? So energy services company. And so what basically what they had done is AIMCO had then agreed to convert $100 million of their loan into shares at a conversion price of $0.05 cents per share. So I had bought the shares for $0.15. Cents. I didn't do any research because I saw, you know, the share price had been around $0.40 cents or something. All of a sudden, it's fallen down quite a bit. I figured, okay, you know, the markets recently have been a little... Uh, jittery. So maybe it's a good time to take a Well, guess what? Right now that share is trading at three cents per share because there were uh, some other investors other than AIMCO that have rights that allow them to buy common shares at 1.6 cents per share. Right? So that company is basically, basically gone bankrupt, essentially. Its creditors have now become its shareholders. So that's what happens when you have a conversion of debt, right? So conversion doesn't always happen under happy circumstances. It is talked about in chapter 16, but I'm going to cover conversion, convertible debt as part of our discussion. Okay, so those are some of the circumstances where early redemption might occur. Now, some of these concepts you have learned in earlier courses, right? So rather than reteach you that basic material, I am going to try to expose you to a more intermediate level of knowledge. However, I will have to make sure that nobody's left behind. So I, I am still going to show you some examples of the basic calculations, all right? So kind of bear with me. And one change that I'm making to the setup of tonight's of, of our class for tonight is I've, I've given you the file. I've, uh, you know, the file that I have uploaded comes with not just the questions, but also full solutions. So last time, from what I remember, it took time for me to type through the answers. And that meant we could go through fewer questions. And then I went and created videos. You know, at the end of the day, it means more work for me. It means more time that you have to spend watching those videos. So I would rather be able to cover as many of those examples in class. All right. So um, please keep in mind that I spent the time ahead of class in preparing the solutions. Right. So I'm not trying to cut corners here. I'm just trying to economize on everybody's time. So please do not kind of just take a backseat. Any part that doesn't make sense you do want to make sure that you post your questions or ask me the questions. Uh, otherwise, it is, uh, you know, um, not the best outcome, All right. Um, so, yeah, thank you, Rachel. Thank you for your uh, appreciation there. All right, talking about long-term notes. So what's a long-term note? Well, what's a note payable? It's a written promise to pay the party that has the note. A long-term note? Well, it's a written promise to pay the party that has the note a specified amount of the money at maturity, and the maturity is going to take place more than a year or operating cycle, whichever is longer. That's all there is, right? A note payable always is a written promise 
to pay the holder of the note specific amount of money at maturity and until then interest if there's any. Now what the thing with notes is you have a contract between the company that's issued the note and the other company for whom it's a note receivable. So it's a one-to-one -one transaction. There's one note holder, one note issuer. Unlike bonds where the, there could be one company that's issued the bonds and there could be literally thousands of bond holders, right? So that's a setup where the company's borrowing money, right? Bonds represent debt. So the company's borrowing money from thousands of people by issuing those bonds. And those bonds are typically publicly traded, all right? A mortgage is where a company goes to a bank and uh, sort of uh, hypothecates, right? You know, uses as collateral uh, some property, right? For which the, uh, the money is being uh, based on the security of which the money is raised from the bank, right? So these are just, a long-term note, a mortgage note, these are just different manifestations of a company borrowing money, right? And borrowing is just a form of getting financing. Another means of getting financing is by issuing equity, right? So there's two basic ways of getting money for a business. You either borrow or you issue a share, right? You issue a stake in the company. Issuing a stake, uh, you know, we'll be talking about it in chapter 15, uh, not always the best idea, especially if you, uh, you know, if you have a company that's the brainchild of a few individuals, you don't want to end up diluting your equity too much, right? If your business model is strong, going for debt, up debt financing would typically be cheaper uh, if you have a strong business model. Otherwise, uh, you know, too much debt can be a bad thing. But having too little debt is also not necessarily the best outcome for the uh, for the owner. Uh, but that's something that I'm sure you would have learned about in a finance class. Mortgage, I just mentioned, it's an amount that's owed to a financial institution. Uh, it's basically the mortgages that we are most <clears throat> commonly familiar with would be a mortgage that we have on a house, a property that we own. And it's basically that property is the title in the property is in our name, but the mortgagee is the bank. So until and unless we pay off the money that we owe to the banker, the banker can, if we ever stop making payments or fall behind payments, the banker can foreclose upon the property, sell it <clears throat> to recover their debt. Right? So um, we may quote unquote, be called the owners of the property, but essentially you're renting it from the bank till the money's paid off. So we're gonna look at a few examples here. Unfortunately, they're all examples of long-term notes. And what I ended up doing is I, I ended up modifying a lot of the requires. Like the textbook is awesome, but sometimes the required, the question, what the questions ask us to do uh, not really, doesn't really jive well with what I'm trying to accomplish in terms of learning objectives. So what I've done is all the questions are more or less modified to some extent, okay? So starting out with example 14.7. In case you didn't get a link, it's here in the chat box. And keep in mind that you can also download a copy of this file as a Microsoft Excel file if you prefer that, or you can click on it and you can make a copy of the Google Sheet and follow along, it's a little easier. Um, so I guess there's a few people that have clicked on the link. All right, so this first question, example exercise 14.7, um, basically talks about a couple of independent situations. In the first case, there's a company called Spartan Inc. on Jan 1st, 2020. They bought land that had an assessed value of $390,000 at the time of purchase. Now the assessment value is, the assessment is carried out by the city, right? And uh, if you own a property, you know, typically the assessment is done in the summer months. That's when, you know, you don't have a lot of snow on the ground and so on. 
right? And the city assessors just drive by. They don't come inside of the property or anything. So they kind of look and they also will look at what the average houses, how much the average houses in the location have been, have, have sold for. Uh, long story short, the assessment value may not always be the fair value, okay? So here we have a dollar value for the land, $390,000, but that may not reflect, especially if right, right now, if I try to sell my house right now, um, the assessment value for my house will reflect the conditions that existed in June, July of last year. And there was for a brief while, uh, quite a craze, you know, it seemed like a lot of interested parties had moved from Vancouver, Toronto, and the Calgary real estate market was doing really hot. And then more recently, you know, that activity has actually gone down quite a bit. And there's talk about prices that have softened quite a bit. So whatever's the assessed value of my house, let's say the assessed value was 400,000. My house might sell today for more than 400,000, or it might even sell for less than 400,000. So that assessment value is not necessarily the fair value, okay? So just be cautious about that. The company issued a $600,000 non-interest bearing note, okay? Non-interest bearing. Um, there is no such thing as a free lunch. There is no such thing as there being no interest. Interest is always, always, always part and parcel of debt. The note is non-interest bearing. So what that means is the $600,000, the face amount includes any interest, okay? So that 600,000 is also not something that we can use reliably. Right. This note is due Jan 1st, 2023. So clearly you can see the transaction happens January 1st, 2020. The note is dated for Jan 1st, 2023. So it's going to be paid $600,000. It's going to be paid off in three years time. Right. So no interest payments between the, you know, through the three years. That's crazy. Right. So obviously that $600,000 number is inflated. Right. So that is also not what the fair value of this transaction is. There was no established exchange price for the land. So that tells us that there's the land value is not, we don't have a fair value for the land and no ready market value for the note. So like it or not, you're gonna have to resort to calculating a present value based on the future cash. The interest rate that's normally charged in a note of this type is 12%. So even though the note is non-interest bearing, it doesn't mean there is no interest. We have to calculate how much the fair value of this note is. Now, how do we do that? We do that by using and putting the details that we need. So we know that the fair value of the note is equal to the present value of future cash flows. And to calculate the present value of the future cash flows, we say, okay, so this note has got a face value. Face amount of the note says the holder will get $600,000, right? So that's the face amount. There is no other interest payment because it's a non-interest bearing note. So there'll be no periodic payments happening. So PMT would be zero. The note matures in three years time. So N is three. And the discount rate we are using is 12%. So if you use those inputs and you calculate the PV, keep in mind that when you're inputting, because this 600,000 is gonna be paid in three years time, when you're using a calculator, you'll need to input that as a negative number. I just, so that it's a lot easier on the eyes, have input this as a positive number because what I did in the formula is I input, like I use the negative symbols in the formula, okay? So if you calculate PV there, the notes present value using the information provided, interest rate is 12%, N is three, there's no periodic coupon payments and the future value, the face amount is 600,000, gives us PV 427, 460. That 
is the amount at which this particular note, this particular transaction is going to be recorded, right? So the companies bought, uh, the company over here, Spartan, has purchased land. So you want to debit land, and it's issuing a note payable in exchange. You want to credit the note payable, and the dollar amount that you're going to use is the 4270, okay? So that's what happens on Jan 1st, 2020, debit the land, credit the note payable. Now, what happens subsequently? Subsequently, because the note has been issued at a discount to its face value, the face value is 600,000. So on Jan 1st, 2023, Spartan will have to pay $600,000 to the other party. Right, but Spartan is only recording the note right now for four hundred and twenty-seven thousand dollars. So there is a gap, right? There is a gap of six hundred thousand minus the four two seven zero six eight. The difference is one hundred seventy-two thousand nine thirty-two. That difference, ladies and gentlemen, is the total amount of interest that Spartan is going to have to bear as a result of purchasing this land uh, in, in, in lieu in exchange for a note payable. That's the total amount of interest. So non-interest bearing doesn't mean there's no interest. There's a heck of a lot of interest here, right? 172,000 and change of interest. Now that interest basically needs to be recorded on a yearly basis until the maturity of the note. So we issued the note on Jan 1st, 2020, the note's going to be due Jan 1st, 2023. So in between, you've got three years, right? So 2020, 2021, 2022. And then right at the beginning of 2023 is when we make the payment of 600000 What we do is we basically will record interest on the note every year. And IFRS says record interest at the effective interest rate. So the effective interest rate for this note is 12%. So we're going to calculate interest every year at 12%, right? So first year, we're going to calculate 12% on 427068. So when you calculate 12% on 427068, you'll get $51,248. Now we're not paying any cash, right? Spartan is not going to pay any cash for the interest, which means that 51,248 amount will simply get added to the value of the note. So what happens is the note amount goes up from 427068 by the 51,248 to 478316. You do that again next year, then 12% of 478,316 works out to $57,398, which again, since you're not paying to the other company, increases the carrying amount of the note. Ultimately, we hit $600,000, okay? Tony has a question. Yeah, yeah, Professor Dill, I just want to double check for the interest here. So, uh, so uh, for Spartan, like as a buyer rate, for the total interest will be one seventy two. Uh, like nine hundred thirty-two dollars in total, right? And yeah. like, do they put do they pay the interest to the bank or to the seller? They pay interest to nobody because the interest is included in oh, the base amount of the note, right? So notice that we are paying zero dollars in cash until the note matures on Jan first, twenty twenty. In none of the years are we actually paying any. We are recording, so we'll be accruing the interest. We're not actually paying any interest to anybody. That is why, right? It's like, uh, you know, you, mm -hmm. you go to your friendly neighborhood mafia boss and say, I want to borrow money. <laughs> and, you know, they, uh, we've, we've seen these in, in really bad movies, right? You know, how quickly somebody borrows a really small amount. And then very quickly, the amount they owe to the other party balloons into a much bigger debt. Why? Because they just keep adding interest on interest on interest. That's what's happening. So basically, the Spartan pay the one-time lump sum payment sixty uh, six hundred thousand dollars, right? That's all they're gonna do. Okay. Yeah. And that's not a partial payment; it's just for pay the one time. 
you know, there is no partial payment, right? So what happens, and I'm, let me just walk you through the journal entries here. Okay. So first year end, because Spartan has uh, an outstanding note, right? So this 427.068, that, that was computed, this $427,000 was calculated using a discount rate of 12%. What Spartan will do is they'll acknowledge, okay, so we owed, right? We took out this loan of mm -hmm. 427,000 and change, and we were supposed to pay interest at 12%. We're not paying any interest. We should have paid interest at 12%. What that means is we need to accrue the interest. So accrue the interest by debiting interest expense for the 51,248. Now, if you had paid the interest, you would have credited cash. And we are not paying anything. So what happens is instead of crediting cash, you credit the note payable itself, right? You're saying, I'm just going to add the interest amount to the note's carrying value. So the note that I had borrowed for 427068, you know, I should pay 51,248 in interest, but mm -hmm. I didn't pay any interest. So now I owe not only the original $427,068, but an additional $51,248. So the amount that I owe to the other party has gone up to four seventy eight three sixteen. dollars I see. Right? Yes. So next year in 2021, you'll now owe them 12% on not the original $427,068, but $478,316. Right? That's so true, next yeah. year's interest is a little bit little bit higher, 12% of the 478. And again, you won't be paying anything to the other party. So that means that amount also gets lumped on, right? Gets carried okay. on or added to the carrying amount of the note. And yes. that is how over time you start from that 427068 and you end up owing on your books, Spartan, will show, oh, we owe this other party $600,000. Guess what? Jan 1st, 2023, that is precisely what Spartan has to pay to the other party. Good. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks. And if you, if you can just double check here the interest, let's add up the interest expense that Spartan will record for the three years. If you add it up, any idea what that number should be equal to? One seven two nine. Three, two. It should be. Eh? <laughs> that is what it is. So we've known it all along, right? We've known this all along that the total amount of interest that we will record on this note is 172,932. And since we are not paying any money until January 1st of 2023, the principal as well as the interest were just all lumped together in the form of that one $600,000. And so Maria has put something in the chat box, the price 600,000 included in it, the interest. Yes, yes. So we will only do the journal entry. So we will record the note, Maria, and then we'll record the interest. And then 2021, you will record the interest, right? Debit interest expense, credit the note payable, 57,398. Then December 31st, 2022, you'll do the same thing again. Debit interest expense credit, right? Let's just do it. Let's just do it for good, 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 good fun. Let's, uh, let me just add up some space here. So December 31st, 2020, the company records the interest. That's it. December 31st, 2021, the company will record debit interest expense, credit the note payable. 57,398. December 31st, 2022, they'll record debit interest expense, credit the note payable. And keep in mind, as you credit the note payable, because the note payable is a liability, liabilities are credits. As you keep on crediting the note payable, the note payable carrying amount keeps going up. So third year, it's 64,286. And that's it. The very next day, Jan 1st, 2023, the company needs to pay the other party 
and we owe them $600,000. We're going to pay them $600,000. How? Debit the note payable, credit cash, $600,000. And basically that is it. All right, does that make sense? Yes, that was so clear. I will pay till next year, it's 2022 right now. <laughs> yeah, so December 31st, 2022, the very next day, although technically it's next year, but you're really paying it next day, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Situation two is kind of similar. Jan 1st, 2020, Geimer Furniture borrowed $4 million from Aurora Inc. through a non-interest bearing note due in four years. And uh, a 10% rate of interest is normally charged for this thing. So again, you're borrowing money here. So you, rather than buying land, you're borrowing money. Right? So you're gonna debit cash, and credit the note payable. Other than that, everything else is the same. The interest rate is 10%, right? So you will have I by Y of 10, and it's a four-year note, so you're gonna have N4, and the face amount of the note is 4 million, so FV will be $4 million. Would you like to calculate the PV using Excel? Like at your end, you want to Confirm. Do we all know how to calculate present value, etc.? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So for this second note then, that's basically what we have. Face value is $4 million. There's no payment because it's still an interest, zero interest bearing note to address Kyle's point there. Uh, Kyle, so um, uh, that's what I, a modification I made to exercise 14.9 is for that because all the questions kind of said, oh, zero interest bearing, zero interest bearing. And I said, you know what? It doesn't have to be zero interest bearing because we know a lot of us know that uh, quite, you know, the automobile dealerships will often give us a, uh, you know, a ridiculously low rate, which is not reflective of what the market interest rate is, right? So uh, if you've ever gone and leased a vehicle or like, you know, you would know that sometimes they'll say, oh, the lease rate is 1.99%. Uh, what if I was to finance it? Oh, then it'll have to be 5.99%. Well, then money costs us 5.99%. Nine percent, right? So how come the lease rate is 1.99? That lease rate is artificially uh, reduced. So what happens is they, I'm sure they're doing some shenanigans at the back, right? They're playing around with, your, with, with, with whatever sticker price they are carrying, right? So you can have situations where even the note can carry an interest rate, but that interest rate is artificially low. So anytime that you're doing a present value calculation, you need to use the market interest rate, right? Always use the market interest rate. So if you have another interest rate, so here, Kyle, in the example that we saw, the interest rate for the note is zero. That is why the PMT is zero, right? The payments are always calculated by multiplying the face value of the note by whatever is the contracted rate, like the stated rate on the note. And that'd be the same thing for bonds as well, because the bonds are essentially, the bond is essentially nothing but a note that the company is issuing not to just one party, but literally thousands of holders, right? That's what a bond is, right? The bond also says, pay such and such dollars, otherwise interest is such and such. So there's not a whole lot of difference in them technically. So the bonds will specify an interest rate. That's the bond rate. So the coupon payments, the regular payments that happen on the bonds are made based on the interest rate that it says on the bond. 
But the market rates, as I was explaining, you know, if the Bank of Canada raises interest rates, the market rates are going to follow suit. They're going to go up. So when it's time for the people who are in the financial markets, right? When we talk about markets, we talk about institutions, individuals, right? If money suddenly becomes more expensive, people are going to ask for a higher rate of return. Now, if the company says, oh, we've got a, we've got a million dollar of bonds and we pay interest at 4%, well, the market is looking for 6%. What do you do? You can't issue the bonds or you can't sell those bonds for a million dollars there, can you? Because, you know, the bonds only pay interest at 4%. The market wants 6%. So something's got to give. And that give is in the form of a lower fair value of those. This concept is ubiquitous. You can kind of, you can take it to put, apply it to notes. You can apply it to bonds. You can do it to whatever, right? So whichever type of liability you're dealing with. Mehak? Mehak, I see you have your hands up. You want to go ahead, ask your question? You're muted, Mehak, so maybe you need to unmute yourself. Hello. Okay, so uh, no worries. If you wanna just type in your question uh, and I can address it when you have it ready there. All right, so while I wait uh, Meg to type in her question, I'll just walk us through this piece here. So $4 million is the face value. There's no payment. N is four here. Market rate is 10 or the, yeah, the market rate would be 10%. So using that, we calculate a present value, 2,732 and change. And just like we prepared an amortization schedule for the earlier one, if you prepare one for this note, then you'll see that, sure, it uh, gets amortized over the four year period. And the, the key is, that at the end of the amortization period, right, at, right, when we hit maturity, the balance in the liability should be equal to the face value. So even though we start with the note at 2732 we should end at $4 million. And what will happen is that the difference between the face value and the present value amount, the 1267946 that's the total amount of interest expense that the company is going to end up recording. All right. So we can confirm that if you add up the total interest for the four years here, that is precisely what it's going to be 1,267,946. And it looks like Max question is ready. Uh, what does this line mean? No established exchange price for the land. Right, so there is the companies did not really sit down and haggle for on on exactly how much the uh, the land is worth, right? So nor did they get a nor did they get a uh, a fair value uh, valuation done at the time the land was bought. The assessment value, as I was explaining, could have happened. The assessment could have taken place sometime in the past. So the assessment value is not necessarily the same thing as how much exactly the land is worth on January 1st, 2020. Okay. All right, looking at uh, another example here. DeRocher Limited in, is, issues an installment note. So an installment note, what's an installment note? Well, you make, um, you make the same amount of payment every year or every, uh, it doesn't have to be yearly, right? It could have be quarterly, it could be monthly. 
so but but every every certain period you'll 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 pay the same amount of money. So Derosher issued an installment note on Jan 1st, 2020, in exchange for land that it had purchased from Safaini Limited. Safaini's real estate agent had listed the land on the market for $120,000. Now again, the listing price is not necessarily the fair value. Fair value is ultimately what an unrelated other party is willing to pay for your asset, right? I can list my house for whatever I want. Doesn't mean that it's gonna sell for that amount. It could sell for more. Because recently I've, I've, I've heard that there have been bidding wars in Calgary, but mostly, you know, you list at a certain price and you end up selling slightly lower than that. So $120,000, good to know, but that's not really the price. The note calls for three equal blended payments of $43,456. And what's a blended payment? It includes an amount for principal, and a certain amount for interest. And the most common blended payment that you would be aware of in your lives is our mortgage payment, right? So if you have a mortgage, pay a mortgage payment on a house, the dollar value that you pay to the bank every month, et cetera, whatever the frequency is, let's assume it's monthly, whatever amount that you pay to the banker every month includes a portion that goes towards the interest on the loan, and the other portion is a small reduction to the loan. What's gonna happen in the case of DeRocher is that it's gonna pay the seller of the land $43,456 every year for three years. So included in the 43,456 would be an amount of principal as well as interest. Now the rate of interest, that is imputed here is 9%, right? That's the market rate at the time. So when we calculate the value of the note, that's what we should keep in mind. Now here, there is nothing after paying the three payments of $43,456, DeRoche is not gonna pay anything more, okay? So there is no face value. This FV stands for how much will be paid at the end of the note. So in the case of DeRoche, there'll be nothing, right? $43,456 is what DeRoche is gonna pay every, every year. And that payment is gonna happen three years for three years. So there's gonna be three such payments. And the yardstick we are using, the discount rate we are using is 9%. Now, if you calculate the PV in this case, right? So Interest rate is 9%, number of payments is three, payments are 43,456, future value or face value is zero, calculate present value, works out to 110,000. Here, we're gonna record the purchase of the land, so debit the land, credit the note payable for $110,000. And then you gotta prepare a <clears throat> note amortization schedule. Now, what's gonna be different in this case is there is actually some cash payment happening. So on January 1st, 2020, DeRoche is gonna record a, <clears throat> a note payable for 110,000. At the end of the year, DeRoche is gonna make a cash payment of 43,456. And we know that this is a blended payment, so it includes a portion for interest and another portion for the principal. <clears throat> the interest is calculated at 9%. Now, 9% of what? 9% of the note value at the beginning of the current year, which is 110,000. So if I calculate 9% of 110,000, the Roche, should have paid interest of $9,900 to the other party. But DeRoche is paying more than that. DeRoche is paying 43,000 and change. So the extra amount that DeRoche is paying, what will it do? What is it? The extra payment that DeRoche is making reduces the principal that DeRoche owns, owes to the other party. And so what that does is that the 
difference, $33,556, the difference between the cash paid and what the interest should be, reduces how much De Roche owes to the other party. So notice here, in the earlier examples, because there was no cash payment, the amortization of the discount resulted in the note amount being increased, right? Being written up. So what I was still doing there arithmetically was I was subtracting, right? I was taking 2732054 and then I was subtracting the amortization. But because my amortization was a negative amount, right? See, amortization reduces. Negative amortization has just the opposite result. Amortization will reduce a balance. Negative amortization causes the balance to go up. And negative amortization loans were a fact in the 2007-8 financial crisis in the US. There were banks that were giving out mortgages to people at ridiculously low rates of interest, but the actual rates were higher. So say the mortgage was given at a rate of 6%, but this party only needed to make interest payments at 2%. The other extra 4% just caused like, you know, you take out a loan for $500,000 and before you know it, like, you know, next, by the end of the year, you owe the bank 520,000, right? In another year later, you owe the bank closer to 550,000. What's happening? Because the bank is charging interest at a higher rate, but you're only paying at a lower rate. Right? And that difference basically ends up increasing how much you owe. Right? So that's basically the concept of the negative amortization. In most mortgages, though, you don't have negative amortization because the mortgage payment is bigger. It's higher than the interest. A part of the mortgage payment ends up reducing how much we owe on the loan. And that's what, what you see is happening. At the end of the first year, De Roche only owes $76,444. Next year, when it calculates interest, it'll calculate interest on $76,444. At 9% rate, the amount of interest that it owes is only $6,880. But De Roche is going to make a payment of $43,456. So the extra payment that De Roche is making will go and reduce the amount it owes even further to the point that by the end of the third year, De Roche owns nothing. De Roche has paid off the entire note. Okay, so that's a typical mortgage scenario. And the journal entries go like this on the date of purchase, debit the land, credit the note payable. You could have credited a mortgage payable if you think that's more appropriate because this is kind of like a mortgage. First year end, December 31st, 2020, we're paying cash of 43,456. So if you follow the accounting logic, I'm paying cash. So credit cash, 43,456. Then you ask, why am I paying this cash? Well, I'm paying partly for interest or interest on money that I owe. So that's interest expense. How much is my interest expense? It's 9,900. So debit the interest expense, 9,900. Now the difference between the cash that I pay, 43,456, and the interest expense that I record, right? See, cash is an asset. Crediting cash reduces the asset. Interest expense will hit the income statement. The difference here is debited to the note payable. And note payable remembers a liability. When you debit a liability, you reduce the liability. Compare it to the journal entry that we had done earlier here. You recorded interest on December 31st, 2020, 273,205. So debit interest expense, 273,205, but you didn't pay any cash. So what did you do? You credited the note payable. And crediting the note payable, because the liability, note payable is a liability, liabilities are credits. When you credit a liability, it causes the liability to go up. You debit the liability, the liability goes down. All right, so it is important for us to understand the mechanics of what's happening here, right? 
there is a difference between 14.7 and 14.8 in just the way the payments are set up. Okay. All right, 14.9, uh, just to satisfy Kyle's curiosity. So I've changed this question. This is not exactly the same. In the textbook, this question still had zero interest. I said, you know, what the heck? We've, we've looked at zero interest. So I changed the fact just a little bit. So Bon Appetito Limited has been experiencing increased customer demand for its specialty food products. To meet this demand on Jan 1st, 2020, the company bought additional refrigeration units to hold more inventory. To finance this purchase, Bon Appetito issued a four year. Uh, in the original question in the textbook, it says zero interest bearing. I changed that to 6% note, okay? So this is a change, it's an adapted, it's modified from the original. If you go looking up the textbook answer, this will not work, all right? This is a different question than the textbook. So there is an interest payment, but it's at 6%, okay? with a face value of 400,000. The prevailing interest rate for similar instruments is 10%. So this is kind of like your leasing a car example that I was using. The interest rate that the company Bon Appetito will pay on the note is 6%, but the market rate is 10%. Now that other party is not, they're not idiots. Right? They're simply doing this to facilitate the sale. So maybe this equipment, or in reality, the equipment isn't really worth $400,000. So what they've done is they've played around with the numbers. Now, when we record, the standards require us to record the transaction at the cash equivalent price, which should be equal to the present value of the note. So you want to calculate the present value of the note. How? Well, it's got a face value, 400000 So that's my FV. This note is going to pay, like, um, there is no blended payment for this note, but this note is going to carry interest payments at 6% of the face value. Interest payments are always made at the face value. So 6% of 400,000, that's $24,000, right? 6% of 400,000, that's 24,000. And there's going to be four such payments because that's a four year note. N is four. The market rate is 10%. So when we evaluate, when we assess this particular setup, we're going to use the I by Y of 10%. And when you run the math, the fair value of this note payable is actually a shade under $350,000, 349282. So what Bon Appetito needs to do is they'll record the equipment, right? They're purchasing equipment, so they're gonna debit equipment. You're gonna credit the note payable. The transaction needs to be recorded, not at 400,000, but rather at the present value of the note, which is 349282. And that is what happens on Jan 1st, 2020. You debit your equipment, credit the note payable, 349282. Now, there's two things that are, that are going to happen for Bon Appetito. Every year, the company will have to pay $24,000 in cash, right? The company will have to pay $24,000 at each year because that's what they've committed to, right? We'll pay $24,000. Now, if you consider the first year, right? December 31st, 2020, the company will be making a cash payment of $24,000. Towards what? Towards interest. Okay, now how much should interest have been? Well, since the rate is 10%, right? The market rate is 10%. And the, we started out with the note at 349,282. It doesn't take rocket science for us to figure out that 10% of 349,282 is $34,928. And that's certainly a heck of a lot more than the 24,000 that Bon Appetito is actually paying, right? The interest expense is more. So the company's paying cash, but it's not paying enough cash, right? 
it's falling short. How much is it falling short by? It's falling short by $10,928. Now that $10,928 of cash that is falling short in its interest, quote unquote interest payment, it doesn't get forgotten or forgiven or anything. It simply gets added to what it owes to the other party. So your note value that you began with the 349282 goes up by $10,298 to hit 360210. You carry out this exercise again the next year, we pay $24,000, but our interest expense should be 10% of 360210. We're again falling short. Oh, don't worry, increase the note. And you keep doing that until you hit the end of the fourth year when the note balance will be 400,000. And that's what you want to happen because the company will actually have to pay $400,000 at the end of the fourth year, right? So that's where it'll hit. Each of the years, what the company is gonna do is they're going to credit cash for the amount that they're paying debit the interest expense or what it should be. And the difference between the cash paid and the interest, because the cash payment is less than the interest expense, the difference is gonna be credited to the note payable liability, making it go up. So if you initially record the note payable liability for less than the face value of 400,000 over it's time to maturity, the liability needs to increase. So Jean has got a question of about 14.8. Uh, so Jean, the $120,000 was the price that the agent of the company had listed the land at. We care two hoots about how much they had listed it at. We'll only record the land for how much DeRocher is actually paid for it. And what DeRocher is paying for it is, well, the, based on the cash flows that DeRocher is making, it is equal to 110,000. So that $120,000 was just to distract us. So imagine you've got a used car, right? Like something that you don't really love anymore. You list it on Kijiji for 10,000. The other party comes and offers you 8,000, you accept. What are you gonna do with the fact that you listed it for 10? Nothing, it's just, it's noise. No, so fair value is, John, the fair value is what the other party is gonna be willing to pay for it. Like we all feel that our asset is the best, but fair value is basically what the market ends up paying. Right? It's the it's the actual established exchange value. Tony, you have your hand up. Yeah, I actually have a similar question uh, in regarding for this like uh, future value because in my logic is that the land could either be appreciated or depreciated, right? So I was just thinking why the future value is zero raise like from this uh, the future value of the land okay 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 this you are looking at it from the point of view of the note so fv for the note is does the roche need to pay anything other than the three installment payments and the answer is no that is why so fv stands for you can call it face value you can call it future value it basically represents what is the final dollar amount that DeRoche will have to pay over and above the regular installments that it's paying? And the answer is no, right? Nothing. DeRoche only has to make three payments of 45, 43,456. Oh, so, so the future value here is not with how much the land is going to be worth oh, or, or any of that stuff, right? That's, that's not what we are dabbling into. You're specifically looking at cash flows, PV is calculated based on future cash flows for the company, all right? No other information should find its way here. Okay. 
Thank you. All right. All right. So that was the third of the examples and uh, good discussion, but I think I'm gonna have to move on and get us taken a look at bonds table, which is sort of the, gonna be the lion's share of this particular chapter. So bonds payable are, they're like notes payable, like you have a note payable with, you know, the company issuing the note owes money to one other party, the, the other party that holds the note. For bonds payable, they're kind of a standardized issuance. So they have standardized denomination, they are debt instruments that are issued in a standardized denomination. Typical denomination is $1,000 or $5,000. There can be other face values, but the most typical ones are $1,000 or $5,000 bonds. And they will have a specified interest rate for the most part that is paid periodically. Now, in real life, most bonds have semi-annual, right? Half yearly interest payments. Most of the examples we'll see will only be doing annual because that just makes the calculations a little bit easier. But if you do have semi-annual, then adjustments need to be made to the PV calculations uh, until they mature. Now, all bonds typically have a maturity date, but it's possible for companies to issue bonds into perpetuity. Uh, and you know, sometimes the companies, the bonds could be issued like you know, hundred year bond or a thousand year bond, right? So there are companies, some companies that issue stuff like that. And then when you have such really exceedingly long maturity dates, they're called bonds, perpetual bonds. And the calculation is essentially PV of the interest payment because the face value, right? I mean, if, you, if the company's issued a bond for 1000 years, who knows where, where we are gonna be in a thousand years, right? So the likelihood of the face value ever being paid is next to nothing. So I'm not going to get down into those exotic uh, scenarios. I'm gonna kind of focus our energies onto more, more regular uh, circumstances that you, could, uh, that you could find, so companies issue. So let's say the company wants to raise a million dollars, right? and it's issuing $1,000 bonds. So the thing to keep in mind is if the company needs a million dollars and each bond that it's issuing has a face value of a thousand, then it'll have to issue 1,000 bonds, right? So 1,000 bonds. Now, who does it ends up issuing those bonds to? Uh, in real life, the companies are not going to bother like going out to the market and try to sell to individual parties. They're likely going to call an investment banker, could be TD, could be JP Morgan, et cetera. JP Morgan will not even talk to us if they're talking about just a million dollars, but you know, make it a hundred million and we could be, you know, we could have a conversation. So, anyways, the big piece is we'll have to sell 1,000 bonds. Um, the typically the company will just sell these bonds to the investment banker and then the investment banker will find other interested parties hey you know such and such pension fund yeah you know it's a pretty good investment here do you want to buy some bonds okay shall i put you down for 50 okay all right so that investment that particular pension fund they're picking up 50 bonds each bond is a thousand dollars they have purchased fifty thousand dollars worth of bonds if you just make a connection to intermediate accounting, you'll remember there in chapter nine, you learned about how such and such company bought $200,000 worth of bonds. Well, what does that mean? $200,000 worth of bonds? If each bond is $1,000, they basically bought 200 bonds. Now, the good thing about bonds is that they are publicly traded. So I could buy... 50 bonds, and if I need some money, I could actually sell some of the bonds, right? I don't have to sell all of the bonds. I can go and sell, you know, $5,000 of the bonds and keep the rest, all right? So all that is possible because the bonds are publicly traded. And when they are publicly trading, the prices of the bonds will, uh, they are quoted as a percentage, right? So you can see uh, you know, such and such bond is trading at 102. 
Well, that simply means the bonds are trading at 102% of their face value, right? That means they're they are trading at a premium or 98.5. It means they're trading at a discount because they're trading at 98.5% of their face value. So why would they trade at a discount? Why would they trade at a premium? Well, that's got everything to do with what the bond rate is, what's the time to maturity, and what's the market rate? Because it ultimately the PV, present value of the bonds is calculated using the market interest rate. So if the market interest rate is more than the bond rate, the bonds will trade at a discount. If the market rate is less than the bond rate, the bonds will trade at a premium, right? And that is something that I'm sure you folks saw in your first intermediate course when you learned about investments in bonds. So this is gonna feel like a little bit of a revision. Some new terminology uh, related to bonds. So there is something called a bond indenture. It's basically the contract that specifies how much, what the face value of the bond is, what the stated rate of the bond is, when the bonds will mature, how often interest payments are to be made, what dates they are to be made on, so on and so forth. The bond rate I just mentioned, that's the rate at which the bonds pay interest. They are the specified contracted rate. Um, <clears throat> so the, the bond rate is also called the coupon rate or the stated rate, okay? So you're gonna hear me use these, this terminology from time to time. I might call it the bond rate, the coupon rate, the stated rate. I'm essentially talking about the same thing, right? And so if I say you got a thousand dollar bond and the bond has a coupon rate of 5%, well, how much interest payment will you see every year on the bond, if I was to ask you? $1,000 bond, 5% coupon rate. What is the PMT on the bonds? Okay, let's try that, Maria. Let's try that one more time. So $1,000 bond, 5% coupon rate. So multiply by 5% works out to 50 bucks. So you were being a little too generous there, Maria. All right, <laughs> just be a little careful. <laughs> so 50 bucks on each of the bonds, right? So if I own 10 such bonds, I'll get $500, right? I'll, I'll, I'll get you to your $500. You just need to own more bonds, that's all, okay? So this is how you calculate the PMT. So if there's a million dollars of the bonds, multiply whatever the face value is by the bond rate, you'll get your PMT, okay? Now, if 5% is my annual rate and the bonds face semi-annual interest, what would be the interest that the, is paid every interest date? So $1,000 bond, 5% coupon, semi-annual interest. What will be the interest payment every interest date? $25. So what did you do? You calculated first the annual rate. And then you said, because there are going to be two interest payments every year, like semi-annual payments means two interest payments, you divide it the $50 by two, and that gives us $25. If there are four interest payments, you'll divide by four, right? So I'm not going to make life too hellish for us. Those are basic arithmetic calculations that we all of us can do, right? Effective rate is the market rate. So at the end of the day, when we are trying to calculate how much the bond is worth, we have to use the market interest rate. So the market rate of other bonds of a similar risk. Now this is where bond rating agencies come into play. Okay, so there are credit rating agencies like Standard & Poor, Moody's, there's a bunch of others that when a company is looking to float bonds, you know, go out to the and tap the bond markets, uh, these credit rating agencies will come in and they'll do due diligence, they'll go through the documentation, they'll go through the financial information of the company, the audited numbers and so on. And based on their computations, they will assign a credit rating, okay? And then you, you have top-notch rating that's AAA, right? AAA, 
And then you'll have other types of ratings that kind of go down. And as your rating goes down, the interpretation is that particular issuer is a little more risky. The way finance works is um, different people have different risk appetite, right? So there are some investors that are not like uh, if you if you're working for an insurance, like if 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 you're dealing with an insurance company or a pension fund, right? They are mandated to not like you know their their bylaws, their charters say you cannot invest in any bonds that are not AAA rated. Right. So if a company, if an issuing company has, you know, is a little bit risky and cannot get a AAA rating, they're out of they're out of play. But maybe there are other people that are willing to lend, right? That are willing to buy those bonds. But they'll be willing to buy the bonds at a slightly higher interest rate. So what happens is Initially, when the bonds are floated, there is some there is some credit there is some credit rating that happens, and that determines how much the bond coupon rate should be at the time the bonds are floated. But then later on, you know, things can happen. A company can become more risky because of things that occurred, like a BlackBerry, right? BlackBerry. 15, 20 years ago was a big, big musk, musk, muscled company. Like it was a, the darling of the investment, uh, you know, markets out there. Everybody had a BlackBerry and that was a thing because of its encryption and so on, because the Apple iPhone had not hit the market yet. You know, the Android phones had not hit the market yet. BlackBerry was a big deal, right? So at that point in time, BlackBerry debt would have been very, very, very highly rated and so on. Things change. Right, things change, and over time, the risk profile of a company could change. And what then happens as a result is that the market interest rate that is applied to a particular company's bonds also changes. So, if the market rate goes up, the value of the bonds, right, the market value of those bonds issued by such company, all right, so that effective rate is something to keep in mind. So, when we are preparing bearing an amortization schedule for interest payments, we use the effective rate at the time the bonds were initially issued, right? And that's under amortized cost model. Uh, otherwise, if you're talking about trading in the bonds, you're gonna use the current interest rate, um, market interest rate to determine what the fair value of the bonds is at a particular juncture in time. I don't want to get into too much technical detail, but this is stuff that you should know. Debentures, well, it's basically bonds that are um, unsecured. Uh, that means they don't have any collateral. Usually bonds have collateral, but if there's no collateral, well, then they are called debentures. Nothing wrong. Like, you know, a company like Apple, if it wants to raise money, Apple is really, I mean, uh, it, it's highly unlikely that Apple is going to suddenly go bust uh, very soon. So Apple could theoretically issue debentures and people would be happy to buy. Normally, when a company is issuing debentures, because there's no, there's no collateral, there's no security being offered, typically unsecured loans will cost you a little bit more, right? So uh, if you go for a mortgage, because you're off offering the house as a security, the rate you get for the mortgage tends to be much lower than the interest rate if you would try to get a personal line of credit without any collateral. Your personal line of credit rate will be typically higher than what you're paying for your mortgage at any point in time. Okay, so there are some deep discount bonds that you could encounter. Deep discount bonds are essentially uh, ones in which there's no regular interest payment. So the company issues the bonds, they will mature 10 years later. There is no interest payment for the 10 years. But people are not going to forgive the fact that there's no, it's, it's just like a zero interest bearing note. The present value of the bonds will be much, much, much lower than the uh, face value. Now, CRA doesn't allow companies to issue bonds too much of a, at too much of a discount. So, Deep discount bonds are not a big thing in, uh, in Canada, but they could be in other markets. 
Uh, bonds can be callable. So that means the company that's issuing the bonds can buy them back uh, before they mature. They can be redeemable at the holder's um, request. And that would mean the, the, the other party that owns the bonds can make the company that issued the bonds buy them back, right? So callable, redeemable, convertible bonds. So that happens if let's say um, the bonds allow the bondholders to convert them, to convert them from being debt into equity. So the holders of the bonds can convert them into common shares. Um, usually it is the holders that would like to, but sometimes circumstances. The example that I shared with you at the start of the class about the Western uh, Energy Resources Company, well, AIMCO didn't really plan to convert its $100 million worth of loan uh, you know, into, into shares. AIMCO now owns a heck of a lot of shares, but it basically means it's in it for the long haul, right? AIMCO would have liked to get its money back, but uh, sometimes when restructuring happens, debt holders become equity holders. Uh, perpetual bonds I've also talked about. These are bonds that are issued with a matured, either without any maturity date or with a maturity date that's really, really, really a long time into the future. So you might hear of century bonds or millennium bonds. So century bonds are bonds with 100 years mature to maturity. Millennium bonds are that have a thousand years to maturity. They're just outrageously so far into the future that nobody really expects to collect on the face value. And so in that case, the calculation is essentially based on the interest payment. All right, we're gonna do a bunch of examples, uh, however many we are able to get through in class, but we have hit a critical juncture point at 7.32. And uh, I believe that we ought to take a bit of a breather, otherwise our brains are just gonna turn into mush. So would you want me to go take, to take a break at this point, or do you want to do one example and then go for the break? What's your preference here? One example, okay. All right, so we can do that. One example and then we'll move. So the first example is problem 14.4. All right, so I have modified this question considerably compared to what the, what's there in the textbook. I'm, I'm still using the textbook's number just because it's not my original question, but I've modified it quite a bit. So the company here, Venezuela Inc. is building a new hockey arena at a cost of two and a half million dollars. I wish, eh? Two and a half million. Our arena, the cost is what? Closer to a billion dollars. So th this, these, these numbers are just classic. Uh, it received a down payment of $500,000 from a local business to support the project and now needs to borrow $2 million to complete the project. It therefore decides to issue 2 million of 10 year, 10 and a half percent bonds. Now, 2 million is the face value. 10 year is the time to maturity. 10.5%, uh, folks, keep in mind, that's your stated rate, the bond rate, the coupon rate. That's the rate at which interest is going to be paid. These bonds were issued on Jan 1st, 2020, pay interest annually on each January 1st. So my little question to you before I move is, how much is the total interest payment? What is the PMT going to be? Face value is 2 million. What is the PMT on these bonds? Is it 2 million uh, multiplied by the percent, the 10.5? That is correct. That is correct. So 
is the bond rate, the stated rate. So if you multiply 2 million by the 10.5%, you get 210,000. So absolutely correct there. I see a lot of you have uh, typed into the chat box. So that's good. So 210,000. Now, why did I ask you that? Because we will be doing a PV calculation, right? So 210,000 is our PMT. Face value is 2 million. Interest payment is annually. So N will be 10. Now, what is the fourth piece of information we need? we need the discount rate to use, the I by Y. Now, we are told that the bonds yield 10% to the investor. So yield, remember, in the terminology I talked about yield, the market rate is also called yield to maturity, YTM. Okay? So when you see the word yield, that tells you that's the market rate, 10%. So I over by Y, I stands for interest, Y stands for yield, okay? Interest yield is 10%. So if you calculate the PV, 2 million is the face value, 210,000 is the payment, number of periods, 10, 10% is the yield to maturity. Now, if I calculate the present value, I get 2,061,446. Now, why is this? Why would the bonds be issued for more than 2 million? The simple reason is the investor only needs 10% return. The company has issued the bonds at 10.5%. Uh, now, in the past, what used to happen is you had to physically print the bonds, right? You had to actually send them to the press. So the company management, the board would meet, they would approve issuance of the bonds, there would, there would be some signing off, et cetera. And then, uh, you know, they would look at the market interest rate at that time, talk to the uh, investment banker, et cetera. And let's say at that point that the company management decided to issue the bonds, the rate was 10 and a half percent. So they signed off, the bonds were sent off for print. And then what happens is like the Bank of Canada reduced the interest rate. So something like that happens, the market rate will go down. But I've already printed the bonds, right? I've already done everything and the bonds are printed for 10.5%. That's what they say on the bonds. So either I go back and reprint, but before I can do that, I'll have to call the board of directors to a meeting and then they have to approve bonds to be issued at 10%. And so, so I say, you know, you know what, like, let's just scrap that. We have bonds that pay 10.5%. If the market is expecting 10%, well, then what we can do is essentially the market participants are also not stupid. You know, it's, it's finance at the end of the day, right? I mean, if the, if the company is paying a highly, a slightly higher coupon than what the market rate is, the market part participants understand and they will basically pay what the present value of those cash flows will work out to be. The market participants know that they'll have to pay a little bit more right now, but later on, they're going to get a little bit higher back in cash because see, 10% of $2 million should only be 200,000. But the company is gonna be paying $210,000 every year. So there's gonna be that extra $10,000 that will over the 10 year period essentially wipe out that, uh, premium okay so if the bonds if they were issued at their present value they would be issued for two million sixty one thousand four six now what happens venezuela paid and capitalized fifty thousand dollars in bond issuance costs now, where does that come from remember i talked about how companies have to hire an investment banker to help because the company doesn't know who to sell the bonds to, right? Who typically people that buy the bonds are insurance companies, pension plans, municipalities in certain places. There could be, I don't know, there could be a whole bunch of different parties that are, you know, that, that are possible buyers. Now the company Venezuela Inc. might not know all of them, but the investment bankers, they know, right? They have contacts. 
So what happens is the company Venezuela will contact the investment banker and the investment banker will help the company float their bonds. And in return, the investment bank is going to charge a fee. So the fee that they charged is $50,000. So the company's paid $50,000 for bond issuance. Under the standards, the bond issuance costs have to be capitalized. What that means is, look, you paid $50,000. It kind of makes, makes sense. I paid $50,000. Well, I credited cash $50,000. What am I going to debit? It can either be an expense or something else. Standards say you can't expense it because they say you got to capitalize it. Well, when it means capitalize, what we essentially do is we debit the bond payable liability, right? Reduce the bond payable liability by the $50,000. So basically what is going to happen here is the company will, basically the company is, first of all, issuing these bonds for 2061446 So debit cash, 2061446 credit the bonds payable liability, 2,061,446. And then it's paying the bond issuance costs of $50,000. Debit bond, bonds payable, credit cash, 50,000. You see, the company doesn't get the cash. Like who gets, who, who pays the company the cash? It's the investment banker, right? So the investment banker most likely keeps its $50,000 from the, 2 million 61 and only sends the net amount to the company. So from a practical point of view, the company only receives $2,011,000 for $11,446 by issuing these bonds. And that is how we record the issuance. Debit the cash for the net proceeds. The 2 million is the net proceeds of issuance. You debit cash for the 2,011,000 credit the bond payable liability, 2,011,446. All right, that's the journal entry to record the issuance. First, calculate what the PV is, and then make sure you subtract any issuance costs from the PV, All right? Now, the bonds have still been recorded at more than the face value. So what do I know? The interest rate, is not 10 and a half percent, because if it was 10 and a half percent that the company is paying, we would have $2 million exactly. But the interest rate is also not 10%, because if it was 10%, we would have had the bonds being recorded for 2,061,446. We are only recording the bond payable liability for 2,011,446. So what has to happen here is for purposes of calculating interest expense into the future and amortizing the bond premium as the case here, we need to calculate the effective interest rate. The effective interest rate is not 10%, the rate at which the bonds were issued to yield the 10% to the investor because what has come in, what has crept into the big picture is the fact that we had to capitalize the issuance cost. You gotta calculate the interest rate at which we can amortize the premium of $11,446. So for that, what you need to do is set things up this way. You know that the face value of the bonds is 2 million. That's how much the company will have to repay at the end of 10 years. And every year for 10 years, the company is going to have to pay $210,000 uh, because that's what the bond statement, the bond stated rate is, 10.5% on $2 million. But the company has received $2,011,446 net at the time it issued the bonds. So using those as input, if you calculate the rate, the I by Y, the Excel formula here is rate, okay? So Excel function is called rate, R-A-T-E. So what you do is if you type in the function rate, R-A-T-E, 
you have to first specify the number of periods. Okay, so that is n. If you're doing it on Excel, it makes better sense because if you if I let me show you the Excel functionality. So if I was dealing with Excel here, so if I type in rate, okay? So if I'm using Excel, Excel tells me what, what inputs it needs. So first thing it wants is number of periods. So I type 10. What is the payment each term? So payment is 210,000. The present value, 2,011,446. Face value is 2 million. And then if I close bracket and I'm looking for a percentage, so I click percentage, now it's showing 10. Now certainly there must be more decimals at the end. So I'm just gonna have to increase the decimals. So the more decimals I increase, look, you know, Excel does a pretty good job of going getting down to the exact specifications. So if I just leave it to, I don't know, um, four or maybe five places of decimal, this is what it would look like, 10.4052 or whatever. My advice to you is don't round it, let Excel or Google Sheets do the math. If you do the math, you get over here 10.4052%. So slightly lower than 10.5, right? And that is why you got the proceeds being slightly more than $2 million. So when I'm calculating interest expense for the future years, the calculation needs to be done at this particular rate, 10.4052. So I prepared an amortization schedule for the bonds. Start with the 2,011,446. Every year, the company is going to pay $210,000 cash. So you see here under the cash column, 210, 210, 210, 210, same number. Now, interest is calculated. So for the first year, my interest is going to be 2011446 times this 10.4052. And notice I'm just using the Excel functions, I'm not typing in numbers. I'm just saying, okay, whatever's the math here, multiply with this number here. And if you're kind of paying attention, I just put in a round function because I kind of like it to be round, uh, you know, whole whole dollar numbers. If you don't want to round, that's okay. That's, uh, that, that's perfectly fine. I, I just used a rounding function. So I said, okay, for the first year, my interest expands works out to 209,296. So look, I'm actually gonna be paying 210,000. So I'm paying a little bit more than the interest. The difference between the cash that I pay and the interest expense that I record, that's the amortization. And what will that amortization do? Because it's a positive number, is gonna make my bond payable liability go down. And so that's what happens. 2,011,446 minus 704, and you get 2,010,746. You do that again the next year, you'll find the interest amount is a little bit lower. The amortization number is a little bit bigger. The liability goes down a little bit more. Over the 10 year period, the liability will go down to $2 million. Now I highlighted this part in yellow here because for the last year, because I was using round function, like I was using, I was making these interest dollar amounts to be exactly rounded to the nearest dollar. There is a bit of a rounding error at the end here. Okay, so I just I just rounded this last amount in, in year 30. Uh, to, and for an exam, that's totally fine. The difference was hardly three or four dollars or something like that. So for a two million dollar liability, two or three dollars is, is, is nothing. 
So why not PV is 2 million? Uh, PV won't, well, so at, on Jan 1st, 2030, the PV will be $2 million. The PV at the beginning needs to reflect the fact that we as a company are gonna be paying interest out $210,000. That's why I asked you, how much is this company going to pay? 210,000, you said. Well, the investor only wants 10% return. So for the investor's point of view, the investor only needed 10%. Well, 10% of 2 million, the investor would have been happy if uh, the company was only paying 200,000. But the company's paying more. So because the company's paying more, the so think of it as a bidding war. Like if the company is paying more than the market expects, the market participants will say, oh yeah, I want it, I want it, I want it, I'll pay more. You end up issuing the bonds payable for more. The bonds are issued at the present value. They are issued at their fair value. The fair value of bonds is the present value of future cash flow. So that is something you really have to wrap your head around. If there is ever any difference between the bond rate and the market rate, the bonds will not be issued at their face value. The bond rate was 10 and a half percent. The market rate was 10%. Because the market rate was lower than the bond rate, the bonds were issued at a premium. Had it been the other way around, if the bond rate was uh, less than the market rate, the bonds would have been issued at a discount. This is simply finance in play. We don't have any control over it, okay? And the other thing to keep in mind is that the bonds are, uh, like every bond has a standardized, so it may have been possible if the company could issue fractional bonds. So, you know, like uh, if I'm issuing $2 million and the face value of each bond is 1,000, you can see that the company has issued 2,000 bonds. If I, you know, because the market was pricing, so how, let, let me just try to uh, play this out, right? So let's say each bond's face value is, is 1,000. Well, then the payment would be 10.5%, so that's 105. So issuance proceed for each bond would have been 10,031. So if I want to raise 2 million, right? If that's exactly how much I need, $2 million, like you said, right? Fair question. If I only needed $2 million. Well, if each bond is sold for $1,031, or $1, I would need to issue 1,000, I'm gonna have to increase. So the company will need to issue exactly 1,939.86 bonds in order to get there. Oh, but there's 50,000 in issuance costs. Oh, darn it. So then I have to issue more bonds. So 2 million, add the $50,000 of issuance costs. The company would need to issue 1,988.36 bonds. The company can't really do that, right? And the other thing, as I explained is, since the board of directors of the company signed off on saying we are going to issue $2 million face value bonds. You cannot not do that. Like you have to follow the instructions to, otherwise you're gonna have some challenges. The auditors will ask and say, well, how come you, your board specified it should have, you should issue $2 million face value. How come you issued less, right? So we try to avoid those complications and just go with uh, what we are told, right? Is that sort of convince you? Okay, man, like this is 7.55, okay? Really very, very interesting, but I think we should take that break now or just carry on. I'm fine with carrying on, but uh, like if, we really go past this, then I would say there wouldn't be any point of taking a break. We can just carry on and, and be done. You guys okay with carrying on for a little bit more?
All right. So that was part A and B. So part A, record the entry for the issuance of the bonds. Part B, bond amortization, showed you that. Prepare the journal entries required for accruing the interest on December 31st, 2020. So end of first year. So we issued the bonds Jan 1st, 2020. The first payment of 210,000, well, that's gonna be made on Jan 1st, 2021 which is technically next year because 2020 will end on December 31st, 20. But the bonds were outstanding for 2020. We got a crew interest expense on them. How much is the interest expense? We know it's 209, 296. We know that we will be paying cash of 210,000 the very next day not paying it on December 31st, 2020, it'll be, the cash will actually be paid next day. So as of December 31st, 2020, what the company needs to do is record interest expense, 209,296. It needs to pay 210,000. It's gonna credit interest payable 210,000. The expense is 209, the payable is 210. The difference, $704, you're going to debit the bonds payable liability. Now, the moment you debit the liability, it causes the liability to go down, and that's it. So come December 31st, debit the expense from the expense column, the interest column, debit the interest payable from this cash column because that's how much cash needs to be paid next day. And the difference to make the journal entry balance, you debit the bonds payable liability. The very next day, go ahead, you're paying cash 210,000, debit the interest payable 210,000 and away we go. You'll repeat that exercise every year into the future. So December 31st, 2021, debit interest expense 209, 222, credit interest payable 210,000, the difference, debit bonds payable $770. December 31st, 2024, well, debit interest expense 208, 953, credit interest payable 210,000, Different debit bonds payable 1047, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. All right, that was part C. Part D, assume that on July 1st, 2023, the company retires half of the bonds at a cost of a million 65 plus accrued interest. Okay, so the company's retiring half the bonds. Retiring means they're just paying off half of the bonds, right? So the moment you pay off the liability, it gets canceled. So it's a de-recognition, right? So you're retiring the bonds, you're buying these bonds back, paying off the bondholders, and you're retiring half of the bonds for $1,065,000, along with the accrued interest. Now, this is happening on July 1st, 2023, July, right? The bond, the interest dates are January 1st. So July 1st, if you'll notice, will be after January 1st, 2023 and before January 1st, 2024, right? So it's gonna be somewhere between these two dates, right? Exactly half midway between Jan 1st, 2023 and Jan 1st, 2024, yeah? So here's a way of making sense. So we are retiring the bonds 
So I've got everything laid out here that should help you make sense of what I'm doing. So the last time we did anything to the bonds payable liability before July 1st, 2023 would have been January 1st, 2023. And at that time, the balance in the bonds payable liability account was calculated at $2,009,105. So if I'm buying back half the bonds, the book value, the carrying amount of the bonds that I'm buying back is 50% of this guy, right? So I'm buying back 50% of this much book value, right? So that is 1,004,553. Okay, that is the book value that I'm buying back. Now, how much am I paying? I'm gonna be paying $1,065, $1,000 to buy back these bonds. And on top of the 1,065,000, I'm gonna pay the accrued interest now, if you look at it, every year, the cash that the company pays for interest is 210,000. Now that's 210,000 for all of the bonds for a full year. Okay, now hear me out. All of the bonds for a full year. If I'm buying back half of the bonds, then I need to take half of 210,000. So if I do half of, 210,000, that goes to 105,000. But hey, 105,000 would be the interest for half of the bonds, but for a full year from January 1st to December 31st, we're buying back the bonds on July 1st, which is exactly in the middle of the year, right? Halfway through the year. So I can't pay them 105,000 in interest. Because I'm buying back the bonds exactly midway. So multiply by another half, right? So half of the bonds, half the year, to so take 210,000, half because I'm buying back half the bonds, another half because I'm paying interest for half a year. So accrued interest is $52,000. Now, since half a year has passed from the last time that I recorded interest expense. See, the last time I recorded interest expense was January 1st of 2023. But since January 1st, like, or December 31st, 2022 to be exact, but since December 31st, 2022, half a year has passed. Like, uh, up to July 1st, 2023, there's been six months, right? January, February, March, April, May, June. Now, I need to record interest expense on the bonds that I'm retiring. Now, if I had not retired the bonds, the interest expense that I would have recorded next will have been 209252. That's how much I would have recorded on December 31st of 2023. Now, since I'm retiring half the bonds, I wanna make sure that I've updated interest expense. So I need to update interest expense. All right, 209052 is the total amount of interest expense for all of the bonds for the entire 2023 year. I'm buying back half the bonds, so times half. And I'm buying these bonds back exactly six months into the year. So another multiply by half, just like I calculated for the cash that we paid for the interest. Similarly, we calculate interest expense on that basis. The interest expense that need to accrue is 52,000 So here's how the math is gonna play out. You're going to debit bonds payable liability for $1,004,553. You're going to debit interest expense 
or 52,263. Then you're going to credit cash for a total of $1,117,500. Now, of course, the total over here, $1,117,500 is not the same as the total of debits, which is 1,056,000. The difference between what you debited and what you credited will represent a loss on retirement of the bonds. Okay, so that is what is shown here. The debit interest expense, 52,263. Debit the bonds payable liability, 1,004,453. Credit cash, 1,017,117,500. And to make this journal entry balance, you need to debit loss on retirement of bonds, 60,684. Now, of course, if you wanna make it look a little bit pretty, you could put the debit, the loss before the cash. You write it this way, it's fine, right? I mean, accounting software is pretty versatile, but this is basically what you end up doing. Debit the bonds payable, you're removing those bonds that you're buying back. Debiting the interest expense, you're accruing interest on the bonds that you bought back. Credit the cash for exactly how much you're paying to buy those bonds back for. And the difference is the loss on it. Now, the way I've shown you is much, much, much simpler than how your textbook does. The textbook will have you first record the interest and then do an amortization and then like it's just too complicated do it this way and you'll be fine but you need to be very sure that you understand what the heck is happening. right so all this is getting recorded make sure to come back and watch this part of the video again in case you are in doubt and do maybe a couple of other practice problems from the textbook early retirement and so on The 1,065, that's easy, Lulu. It comes from the question. The question said that the company retires half of the bonds at a cost of 1,065. I like the easy questions. <laughs> All right, good people. Part E is basically just to tell you, look, I mean, if we had issued these bonds for like a different yield, like 12%, like the original question said, the bonds yield 10% to the investor. Because the bond rate is 10.5%, if the market rate at the time we issued the bonds was 10%, we saw, hey, we would issue the bonds, the present value of the bonds would be, more than their face value. But what if this rate was 12%? Well, you can see that then in that case, the bonds would have been issued at a discount. The rest of the process would still have been the same. Right? You would still have to subtract $50,000 of the bond issuance cost to get the net proceeds of 1,780,493. And then you would have to calculate your effective interest rate, which would then be 12.48%. And then you would use that rate to calculate the amortization schedule. So that is basically what I have done in my answer to part E. I will leave it to you to kind of go over the numbers here and it's, and after eight, I need to take a little bit of a breather. So my, <laughs> my apologies, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask you to please uh, at your end, uh, scroll up and down, take a look at the numbers if they make sense. And once we come back, uh, let me know if you have any follow-up questions or I'll just walk you through uh, to the rest of the questions. All right, so 10 minutes for me, please. All right, okie dokes, you're very kind people. 
So I'm just going to pause it. Okay, so before we went for the break, I asked you to take a look at uh, the answer to part E, repeat parts A and B, assuming the bonds were issued to yield 12% to the investor. And I briefly mentioned, I briefly shown you that if the bonds were issued to yield 12% to the investor, you'd first need to calculate the present value using 12% as your discount rate. Now, since the bonds only pay interest at 10.5%, if the market rate had been higher than 10.5%, then the bonds would actually have been issued at a discount to face value. Then on top of that, if you subtract $50,000 for the bond issuance costs, that's going to reduce the carrying amount even more. And so the effective interest rate would work out to more than 12%. So did you have any queries about that or does that conceptually make sense? The math, of course, you know, is something that you kind of need to go over, but conceptually, does that jive with uh, your recollections from earlier courses? Makes sense. All right, Rachel, I'm going to take your word for it. Which then brings us to part F for the question. If Venezuela chose to apply the fair value option, which is uh, permitted under IFRS 9, how would this affect the amount of interest expense that it recognized each year and over the 10 year term of the bonds in total? Well, I didn't really answer that question. I just said, hey, if the FPPL option is, is employed, the issuance costs for the bonds would have been expensed instead of being capitalized. So that's number one. The issuance costs would not have been capitalized. We would have recorded that as an expense. The interest expense itself would have been recorded at the coupon rate of 10.5%. So, Basically, the total interest that would be recorded over the 10 year period will be 210,000 times 10 or $2.1 million. Whatever changes occur to the fair value of the bonds will have been recorded in profit or loss. So if the fair value of the bonds goes up due to market rates of interest going down, it would have been reported on the balance sheet or the income statement rather as a gain. If it went down, it would be recorded as a loss. So that again, depends on how the market interest rates behave over the 10 year term. The total interest otherwise that is recorded would have been this, right? It would have been equal to the sum of the interest expense, which is 2,088,554. That 2,088,554, if you're interested, we could have predicted that's how much the interest expense was going to be. And you might be wondering how, Harjinder, how, how? Well, let me show you how. We've known all along that this company is going to be paying $210,000 of cash interest payment every year for 10 years. The total cash that the company is gonna be paying is 2.1 mil. Included in the 2.1 million is the amortization of the premium. Now, how much was the premium? Right, we recorded the bond payable liability for 2,011,446. The face value of the bonds is $2 million. So the premium is $11,446. Look at what the difference is between the total cash paid and the total interest expense. Notice that's nothing but the total premium, 11446 Since we knew what the total amount of the premium was at the time we 
recorded the bonds payable liability, we could have simply subtracted that from the cash payment and we could have predicted that's my total interest expense for the entirety of the duration of the bond. Right, so amortized costs, our total interest expense works out to the difference between the total cash paid and the premium at the time the bonds were issued. If the bonds were recorded as FPPL, we will not be recording, first of all, we would not have capitalized the issuance costs. These would have been expensed. So we would have recorded the bonds for 2,061,446. The total interest will have still been equal to the $2.1 million, the coupon payment, and any changes in the value of these bonds over the years will have been captured in PNL. All right, does that, that make sense here? Right, so hopefully like, you know, you're getting the message that I'm trying to communicate that this stuff is conceptually doable. It's a lot of work. I, mean, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't dismiss it and say, oh yeah, there's nothing to bonds, but it's doable if you understand what the underlying mechanics are. So moving on to, okay. So the, these two are a couple of examples of uh, trouble debt restru re, um, restructuring. So over here, an example is uh, for Strickland Inc. that owes Heartland Bank some money, $200,000 plus $18,000 of accrued interest. Remember I was talking about debt modification and uh, restructuring. And I said, that's not the best outcome. So over here, Strickland owes money the debt is a 10 year, 10% 10 note. In 2020, Strickland's business declined due to a slowing regional economy. And how prescient is that, right? This, 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 uh, uh, I think this particular edition came out in 2019. And I doubt very much that the authors of this book could have predicted COVID, but COVID did hit and hit badly and a lot of businesses were impacted. And um, so anyways, on that somber note, the company, the business of Strickland slowed down. And um, it's likely the company's in a bad shape, right? It's in a bad uh, economic shape. So there's two required here. In the first case on December 31st, 2020, the bank agrees to accept an old machine and cancel the entire debt. So really what's happening? The bank says, hey, we need our money. Strickland says, I don't have any. The bank says, okay, I'll have to take something of yours. Strickland says, do whatever, right? Be my guest. The bank says, I'm gonna pick up a machine. And like, I'm laughing, but you know, uh, you know, things happen sometimes to businesses and that's what's happened here. The old machine had an original cost of $390,000, accumulated depreciation of $221,000. So $390,000 minus $221,000 of accumulated depreciation. The carrying amount at the books of Strickland for this machine is $169,000. Artland Bank is owed $200,000 plus $18,000 of accrued interest. The fact that Strickland Inc. is saying, be my guest means, well, they really don't have the money. They don't really have the ability to pay off the bank's loan. So the bank loan outstanding is 218,000. And look what's happening. The bank is pulling a machine. Now, the book value of the machine is 169,000, but the machine's fair value is 180, right? So the bank is getting a machine 
that has a fair value of $180,000. Now, if you look at from the bank's point of view, the bank is going to get the machine that has a fair value of $180,000. So the, from the bank's point of view, the bank is basically losing $38,000. The amount that it's owed and the fair value of the machine that the bank is getting, $38,000. The bank is losing on this particular transaction. But think of it from Strickland's point of view. Strickland owes the bank a liability. The, the, the amount that Strickland owes to the bank is 218000 Strickland is able to forget about that loan by giving up the machine. The machine has a carrying amount, net book value on the books of Strickland of $159,000. This is good news, hey? From Strickland's point of view, they're saying, listen, my business in the, is in the dumps anyways. You know, I'd sooner give up this machine because probably Strickland's management is thinking about wrapping things up. Saying, okay, fine, take my machine. And I can forget about $218,000 of the loan. So from Strickland's point of view, they're actually looking at a, an overall gain of $49,000. Now, what is that $49,000 made up of? The machine's fair value is $180,000. So the way this accounting audit accounting standards go, Strickland is going to record a gain on disposal of the machine. The fact that Strickland is giving up the machine to Heartland Bank means Strickland is disposing of the machine, right? Giving up, disposing. So from Strickland's perspective, the transaction is measured at the fair value of the machine being given up. So that's 180. Book value 169. So there's an $11,000 gain on disposing the machine. And that is from Strickland Inc's point of view. And then the fair value of the machine given up is 180, but Strickland will basically be able to wipe out $218,000 of the loan. So like I got rid of $218,000 that I owed, but just giving up the machine and the machine was only worth $180,000. So there, due to this restructuring of the debt or whatever you wanna call it, settlement, right? The debt is being settled here, right? There's no more debt. I will forget about the debt. There's no restructuring, it's a settlement. So there is a gain on settlement of the debt, $38,000. So 38,000 because of settling the debt, 11,000 because of disposing of the machine. Strickland's financial statements will show a total gain of $49,000. Now you should not be so naive to think, oh, that's a great deal. This whole thing happened because Strickland Inc. is in a really bad financial situation. Okay, so keeping that in mind, that's your journal entry for part eight. Get rid of the note payable for 200,000. Get rid of the interest payable, the interest amount that has been accrued on the note, $18,000. Get rid of the machine. The cost of the machine is 390. The accumulated depreciation is 221. And then as I explained, there's an $11,000 gain on disposing the machine and $38,000 gain on, yeah, I won't call it restructuring, the debt is being settled, settlement of debt. Does that make sense? Yeah, all right. Assume instead, that Strickland decides to grant the bank 15,000 of its common shares, which have a fair value of $190,000. This is in full settlement of the loan obligation. Again, Strickland owes the bank $218,000. By issuing common shares, which have a fair value of $190,000, 
Strickland is able to wipe that slate clean of any debt, right? The 200,000 debt plus the 18,000 of accrued interest, it's all gonna be wiped out. Strickland is still coming out ahead, right? And because this is a non-cash transaction, the transaction is valued at fair value of consideration received unless, and then since we have common shares being issued, there's a IFRS 2 that is involved and under IFRS 2, the transactions recorded at fair value consideration received unless the fair value of common shares is more reliably measured. So we here, the fair value of the common shares is the more reliably measured number. So look, taking that into account, you get a gain on settlement of debt, not a restructuring, gain on settlement of debt, $28,000. Restructuring, in my opinion, is what happens in 1424. Look at 1424. Here, so a restructuring of debt is that the debt will continue, right? The debt is not going away. The debt will continue. The terms of the debt will be modified, be changed. Okay? So here for Strickland, the debt is in both cases wiped out. The debt is no longer there, it's a settlement. If the debt will continue, but with changes in terms, then that's a restructuring, okay? They're both due to unfortunate circumstances. We have to be very clear about that. You know, the fact that you end up recording a gain should not make you feel like, oh yeah, good job. No, it's, it's, it's a bad time, right? It's a bad time. This accounting that's resulting in some kind of gain being recorded. Um, <laughs> I, well, if you're talking about the bank, uh, Maria, then the bank is going to record a loss, right? The, from the bank's point of view, this is a loss. From Strickland, the company's point of view, it's a gain. But it's like, a, you know, I was, I was really in a bad shape and uh, somehow a miracle has occurred and I'm calling that miracle a gain. It's, 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 it's nothing due to, it, it's not at all due to the acumen of my, my company's management, you know. Anyhow, coming back to 1424. That's another example here. You do see a, a restructuring take place. So Green Bank enters into a debt restructuring agreement with Troubled Inc., which is now experiencing financial trouble. The bank and December 31st, 2020. How prescient is that, right? December 31st, 2020. That would have been a time when uh, the impact of COVID, especially if the company had not been a beneficiary of the federal government's largesse in terms of wage subsidies and so on, many businesses did go under. So they're experiencing financial trouble. The bank agrees to restructure a $2 million, 12% note receivable, originally issued at par by following notifications. The bank says, you know what, I, we will reduce the principal obligation from $2 million to 1.9 mil. So we'll take what's called in finance terms, it's called a haircut. Bank is agreeing to a haircut of $100,000, reducing the, the carrying the face value of the loan from 2 million to $1.9 million, extending the maturity date. So the note was actually due December 31st, 2020. The company said, sorry, I don't have any money. The bank said, uh-oh. <laughs> you know, so uh, the bank said, oh, you need more time. Okay, we'll give you more time. Don't worry, don't worry. You know, we'll extend the due date by three years. And oh, the company said, you know, 12% is too high. How can we pay you that much? Oh, don't worry, don't worry. We'll reduce it from 12% to 10%. Anyhow, we can find this funny, humorous, or tragic. But anyways, the question is, how do we account for it, right? How do we account for this? So in the first instance, we're asked, 
assuming that Trouble prepares its financial statements in accordance with IFRS. Prepare the journal entries for the debt restructuring on December 31st, 2020, and the subsequent entries up to the repayment of the debt on December 31st, 2023. Now that's really not consistent with what they're saying here. January 1st, trouble pays 1.9. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to comment on that. I didn't catch up on, on, on that little discrepancy in the textbook question, but the bottom line is, whenever you have changes in the terms of the loan, what you need to do is calculate the present value of the note, right? Present value of the loan uh, using the original effective interest rate. Okay, so IFRS says, use the original effective rate. Now the original effective rate was 12%. Now 12% I by Y, what is happening? The face value is changing to 1.9 million. Annual payments are going to be 10% of 1.9 million, so $190,000. And the time to maturity from December 31st, 2020 to December 31st, 2023, well, that's three years. So if you calculate the present value, of the modified loan terms. So three years to go, 1.9 million will be the face value. Every year, the interest payable is 10% of 1.9 million. So $190,000 each year using the original effective interest rate of 12%, we get a present value of 1,800,000 and change. Now this number, if it represents a change of more than 10% of the original value of the loan, the original debt was $2 million. So more than 10%, if the change is more than 10%, then it'll be called a substantial modification and it will be considered as if the old loan has been settled and it has been replaced by a new loan. But when you calculate the numbers, the way they work out, the present value of the revised terms is 90.44%. So the change is only 9.56%. 9.56% is not more than 10%. So here we'll say, it is not a substantial modification. So then what happens? We are not going to consider this a settlement. It's not a settlement, it's a modification, it's a debt restructuring. So what needs to happen under IFRS is that we will reduce the original loan down to the present value that we just calculated. So the present value that we just calculated is 1,808,730, which when I compare to $2 million of the original loan is a reduction in the amount of 191,270. My loan has gone down, my note payable went down by 191,270. The original amount was 2 million. Now that note is worth 1,808,730. My note went down, so debit the note. And because my loan, went, like my loan went down, I'm able to record a gain on restructuring of debt, 191,700. Okay. From this point onwards, what our friend Troubled is gonna do is it is going to continue to record interest expense at 12%. And what that's going to do, because the payments are all $190,000 each year, 
but troubled is calculating interest at 12%. What that's going to mean is every year that note is going to keep creeping up and up and up and up until it hits $1.9 million. So you're going to record interest expense each year for the amount of the interest. You're going to credit cash each year for the amount of the cash. And the difference, you're going to keep crediting the note payable liability so that it keeps creeping up and up and up until it hits 1.9 million, which then you pay off at the end. And Bob's your uncle. Does this make sense? What about Aspie? Well, Aspie says, okay, if there is no sig uh, substantial modification, then what we want you to do is, we don't want you to reduce the original loan, right? We want you to keep it as is, but we want you to calculate a new effective interest rate, which will cause the original loan to be reduced down to the new modified loan. So ASPE is a little funny. So what you do there, because there's no substantial modification of debt, what you do is you say, well, right now on our books, the loan is sitting at $2 million. The bank has agreed to reduce the carrying amount, so reduce the face value rather of the loan, to 1.9 mil. The bank has agreed to reduce the, the interest rate to 10%. So that's every year we're only going to pay $190,000. We're going to pay for three more years. Well, what is the discount rate that will make this work? So calculate I by Y, right? Calculate a new effective rate. Now that new effective rate works out to 7.9592%. So under ASPE, we do not record this gain on restructuring, right? There's no gain on restructuring business. So instead rather you calculate, you recalculate a new discount rate that'll make this happen. So starting with a loan value of $2 million, you say, okay, we're gonna pay cash of $190,000 at the end of the first year. You say, okay, that's gonna include interest of 7.9592% of $2 million, which is 159184. And because my interest expense is less than the cash paid, the difference will reduce the loan a little bit. Do that again in 2022, goes down again a little bit. Go that one more time in 2023, the loan is brought down to 1.9 million, which is basically the amount that trouble needs to pay back to its bank. So here the entries are quite a bit different. You do not record this gain on restructuring at all under ASPE. And instead, what you're seeing is what's happening is the amount of interest expense that you end up recording is much smaller. And the result is that the note payable liability goes down every year by a little bit until you hit 1.9 million. End of the third year, you pay back 1.9 million and Bob's your uncle. Hello, this is Harjinder, and as promised, I'm going to talk about convertible bonds in this video. So the material for convertible bonds is uh, taken from Chapter 16, the Complex Financial Instruments Chapter. However, it is related to our discussion of bonds payable that we uh, carried out in Chapter 14. 
So what happens in the case of a convertible security issued by a company is that, um, so if we, if we just limit ourselves to the discussion of convertible bonds for a moment, uh, what happens with convertible bonds is that the, um, the bondholders are able to um, convert them, uh, the bonds into shares of the company. Now, sometimes companies will also issue bonds with other types of financial instruments like warrants. So warrants is something that we will learn about in chapter 16, but basically what, what they do is they allow the holder, the warrant holder to buy um, shares of the company at a uh, predetermined price. All right, so um, it could be like, you know, the warrant bond, the person that holds the warrant would want to exercise it if they are able to buy the shares at a cheaper price than would be available on, on the stock market, right? So it's kind of like an option. Warrants are like an option. You may have heard about options, uh, stock options and, and such. So that is material that will be covered in chapter 16. For this particular video, I'm going to talk about exercise 16.9. And uh, there are some unrelated transactions uh, that are talked about in the exercise. And what we're going to do is record journal entries for these transactions. So in the first case, we have on March 1st, 2020, Loma Corporation issued $300,000 of 8% non-convertible bonds at 104, which are due February 28, 2040. So long duration, 20 years. In addition, each $1,000 bond was issued with 25 detachable stock warrants, each of which entitled the bondholder to buy one of Loma's common shares for $50. The bonds without these warrants would normally sell at 95. So, you know, the 104, 95, these are ways of communicating relative to the face value, how much the bonds were issued at, or how much they would have normally been issued. So something we have to pay attention to is the face value of the bonds. The face value of these bonds is 300,000. The company issued them at 104. So that tells us that the company issued these bonds at 104% of their face value. So if I take the face value of 300,000, 104% means multiply by 1.04. So the company got $312,000 cash by issuing these bonds. Now, why did the company manage to get more cash than the face value of the bond? Well, the reason is that these bonds um, came with warrants, right? So the warrants acted as a sweetener uh, for the, uh, uh, you know, the, the people that bought these bonds. If the bonds had been without the warrants, they would have only sold at 95. So what does that mean? If the bonds did not have the warrants, we would only have been able to get 95% of the face value, 285,000. So fact of the matter here is that the company managed to get $312,000 for issuing the bonds with the warrants. As the company issued the bonds without these warrants, they would only have sold for 285,000. So the difference, the extra $27,000, well, that is the cash that the companies received because it also gave the holders, the bondholders, uh, each $1,000 bond came with 25 warrants, each of which allows the bondholder to buy one of the shares for $50. Now, imagine in the year 2040 or up to that time, if the company, if Loma Corporation stock price goes up higher than $50, 
having those warrants would be uh you know quite a quite a valuable uh, option for the bondholders and that is the reason why the bondholders were willing to pay extra for these so that's basically the underlying uh, transaction here. You debit cash for $312,000, credit the bonds payable for how much the bonds would actually been sold for had they come without the warrants. So that's $285,000. And the difference, $27,000, because it was received uh, on account of the warrants, uh, warrants are a financial instrument, um, and uh, they are, um, since the companies received cash towards these warrants and the company will need to issue common shares at a later date if the people that have the warrants choose to exercise it, they are recorded in an account called contributed surplus. We will be looking at contributed surplus in more detail in the in chapter 15 when we look at shareholders equity. And then again, when we talk about chapter for the time being, just uh, know that contributed surplus is a shareholders equity account. Uh, it's separate from common shares or retained earnings, right? It's a separate category of shareholders equity. All right, so that was the first example. The second one, Grand Corp issued uh, $10 million of power value, 9% convertible bonds at 97. So again, 10 million is the face value. The company issued these bonds at 97, which means 97%. 97% of 10 million will work out to $9,700,000. If the bonds had not been convertible, the company's investment banker estimates they would have sold at 93. So if we just pause and think, you know, the bonds would have sold at 93% if they were not convertible, right? So the fact that they allow the bond holders, right? Being convertible means the bonds allow the bond holders, the people that subscribe to these bonds, the option of buying of or, or converting these bonds into common shares if they like, if they want to at a later date. So because that the ability, right? You know, so not having a, an obligation, but having a right to, uh, to, do, to be able to do so is considered of value, right? So if these bonds had not been convertible, they could only have been sold at 93% of the face value, which is $9.3 million. So we're gonna record the bonds payable liability at its fair value, which is 9.3 million. The company's received cash of 9.7 million. The difference between the two represents contributed surplus. And in this, this case, it's conversion, right? So. In the first case, we had warrants. In the third, second case, because the bonds come with the right to convert them into common shares, we record contributed surplus conversion rights. Again, keep in mind, if the bondholders decide to actually exercise this option, the company will need to issue new common shares. So the amount that we earmarked is recorded as part of shareholders' equity for that reason. All right, number three, Hussein Limited issued $20 million of par value, 7% bonds at 98. So again, the face value is 20 million. The bonds were issued at 98, which means 98%. So 98% of 20 million, if you do the calculation, I think it works out to $19,600,000 million and $600,000 in total. One detachable stock purchase warrant was issued with each $100 par value bond. At the time of issuance, the warrants were selling for $6. Hussein Limited has adopted ASPI. So when a company follows ASPI, under ASPI, the company could choose to um, record the warrants at zero, basically not record any amount for the warrant and they could record the entire um, issuance proceeds 
as bonds payable. So they could have just on debit cash, credit the bonds payable for $19.6 million. However, um, the company can also record an amount for the uh, the warrants, the conversion, right? So there is contributed surplus that we learned about. So when a company is following ASPE, they've got the two choices. Now, assuming the company does record contributed uh, for the, for the warrants, um, what it needs to do is determine which of the two, uh, you know, is the value of the bonds best or better determinable, or is the value of the warrants more easily determined? And in this case, at the time of issuance, the warrants were selling for $6 each. Well, that tells us that the warrants, the value of the warrants is, uh, is more easily determined. So we will allocate first an amount for the warrant and whatever is remaining, we call this the residual method, whatever amount is left over after that gets recorded as the bond liability. So now, how many warrants are there? Because each warrant was selling for $6, one detachable stock purchase warrant was issued with each $100 par value bond. So if you think about it, the companies issued $20 million worth of bonds, right? So that's 20 million. If I divide that by 100, it gives me 200,000 warrants. So a total of 200,000 warrants have been issued and each warrant is selling at $6. So if I multiply 200,000 by six, the dollar amount that we need to allocate to the warrants would be 1.2 million. The total issuance proceeds, as we talked about, were $19,600,000. Out of the $19,600,000, we allocate 1.2 million to be contributed surplus for the warrants, and the difference gets recorded as bonds payable. Now, had the company been following IFRS, it has to allocate a, an amount towards contributed surplus warrants. Unlike ASPE, IFRS doesn't give any choice to the companies in this matter. So as I said, the company, because the company reports under ASPE, they could choose to measure the warrants at $0, in which the entire 19.6 million would have been recorded as a liability. All right, number four. On July 1st, 2020, Tian Limited called its 9% convertible bonds for a conversion, right? So in this case, the company was had the ability to convert the bonds into common shares and the company exercised it to do so on July 1st, 2020. The 10 million of par value bonds were converted into 1 million common shares. So $10 million was the uh, liability face value of the bonds. Uh, the company <clears throat> called in uh, for conversion and uh, basically uh, those bonds got replaced with uh, common shares, 1 million common shares. Now, on that date, on July 1st, there was 75,000 of unamortized discount applicable to the bonds. So keep in mind, if their bonds had been issued at a discount, over time, the discount is amortized down to $0. So, you know, the bond face, the bond carrying amount on the books would be brought up to equal the face value upon maturity date. So at the time of conversion, the face value of the bonds was 10 million, but there was $75,000 of unamortized discount, which means the carrying amount of the bonds on the books of the company was 9,925,000, all right? So that's the carrying amount of the liability. Now, we have to de recognize the bonds payable. So we're going to debit the bonds payable liability at $9,920,000. Now, what has happened? The companies converted these bonds into common shares. So if these were convertible bonds, 
Originally, when these bonds were issued, the company must have recorded some contributed surplus for the conversion rights. So in this case, yes, that is true. At the time of conversion, the balance in the account called contributed surplus conversion rights was $200,000. So now that the bonds are being converted into common shares, the contributed surplus conversion rights account is no longer needed. So what we do is we debit contributed surplus for the 270,000. You're gonna debit the bonds, right? Because the bonds are getting converted. There will no longer be any, any bonds remaining. So you debit the bonds for 9,925,000. And also because the bonds are getting converted, the contributed surplus is no longer needed as well. So you're gonna debit that. Remember it's, it was originally recorded as part of shareholders equity. So now that you no longer need this account, you're going to debit. So debit the bonds, debit the contributed surplus, and the entire total, the two, gets credited to common shares. So recall, we had issued a total of 1 million common shares. That was the number of common shares. The 10,195,000 is the dollar amount that gets recorded to the common shares, right? This is called conversion happens at book value. Anytime a convertible security gets converted, we record it at book value, right? So that's, that's what's happening. Now, there was something else that happened. The company um, needs to convince the bondholders that they should uh, uh, convert their bonds into common share. And so this company, TN Limited, actually paid an extra $65,000 to the bondholders to induce conversion of all the bonds. So this extra $65,000 that the company paid, um, you know, this 65,000 was paid in cash. So you're gonna credit cash for $65,000. Now the extra, this extra inducement that the company's paid, it has to be split. Right? It has to be split between the, um, the bonds. So a portion of the $65,000 was uh, goes towards the bonds and the, the rest is recorded as retained earnings, debit to retained earnings, right? So that's what's happening here. So if we, if we just look at the extra information, the bonds fair value at, the, uh, at July 1st noting the conversion feature, the bonds' fair value on that date was 9,955,000. So had the company not converted the bonds, but rather gone and retired the bonds, recall in chapter, in chapter 15, we talked about a company buying back its bonds, right? Retiring them early. So if the company had retired these bonds, they would have actually needed to pay $9,905,000. So we take the stand that, all right, but we, we recorded the conversion at book value, right? The book value of the bonds we said was 10 million minus $75,000 of the discount, so 9,925,000. But had we bought back the bonds rather than converting them, we would have to pay 9950000 thousand. So instead of converting the bonds and debiting the bonds payable liability for 9925 if we had bought back the bonds at fair value, then we would need to pay 9955000 And that's an extra $30,000, right? The company would need to pay an extra $30,000 for that. So that out of the $65,000 cash that the company paid, you know, you can pretend that $30,000 was paid because we wanted to convince the bondholders to agree to conversion. And why would they agree to the conversion if they, you know, they felt that they weren't really getting a fair value for their thing, then they would say no, right? So the fact that we had to pay an extra, extra, extra amount of money uh, to convince the bondholders to convert their bonds into common shares, 
Well, out of that 65,000, we say 30,000 is because of the bond. Right? So there was a loss on redemption of the bonds, $30,000. Now we actually paid 65,000. So the difference between the two amounts, $35,000 that we paid extra, it gets debited to retain the earnings, right? So that, that's basically an amount that the current existing shareholders have to absorb, okay? So we, uh, we, we, we needed the liability to move from our books and as a, you know, as a consequence, we had to agree to paying an extra $65,000 to convince the bondholders to convert their bonds into common shares. Well, that's the cost that the current shareholders have to absorb. And remember that retained earnings is something that belongs to the common shareholders. The common shareholders are shouldering that extra $35,000. The $30,000 loss on redemption, well, that's going to be reported on the income statement. The $35,000 excess, it gets debited to retained earnings directly. Okay, so this is a requirement under ASPE. IFRS is silent. So in your textbooks, a solution to this example, uh, they just uh, you know debit the loss on redemption $65,000 and credit cash for the $65,000. But CPA Canada prefers that we split uh, the amount, the inducement amount uh, to the bonds, a portion that should be allocated to the bonds and the other portion will retained earnings. So uh, for this course, I want you to follow this approach. And that brings us to the last of the examples here. And the last example is on December 1st, 2020, Horton Company issued 500 of its $1,000 9% bonds at 103. So 500 bonds, each bond has a face value of $1,000. You can multiply the two, you know, total face value is 500,000. And the company issued these bonds at 103, which means 103% of the face value is how much the company received in cash. So if we do the math, multiply 500,000 by 103% or 1.03, the company received $515,000 total in cash. Attached to each bond was one detachable stock warrant entitling the holder to purchase 10 of Horton's common shares. On December 1st, 2020, the fair value of the bonds without the stock warrants was 95. Well, if there were no warrants, the company would only have been able to get 95% of 500,000, which is $475,000. The company actually got 515,000. So the difference between what the bonds are worth without the warrants and what the company got by issuing the bonds with the warrant, $40,000, that will be recorded as contributed surplus. So pretty similar to the earlier example. Debit cash, 15, credit the bonds payable for 405,000 and the difference gets credited. And that concludes this short video talking about convertible bonds. In the next week's class, we will cover chapter 15 uh, and that's shareholders equity. And also a reminder that we have our first quiz scheduled for next Friday and the quiz will cover chapters 13 and 14. Bye for now.